Half of China's population lives in the big coastal cities of the east, like Beijing and Shanghai. But away from the heavily populated east, heading west to the outer provinces of Tibet, Xinjiang and Yunnan, the more diverse and mysterious this country becomes. Here, the harsh, unforgiving landscapes forge strong, resourceful people with unique lifestyles and heritage. Even in these remote regions, the winds of change are blowing hard. The future's arriving fast as China's secret lands are revealed. In the far reaches of China is the country's largest province, Xinjiang, a land of contrast and extremes, scorching desert, bountiful harvest, frozen peaks, lush grasslands, an ancient history of multiculturalism. This kaleidoscope of cultures has the promise of a prosperous future as Xinjiang rises again. Xinjiang is massive, about the same size as Iran, twice as big as Turkey, and bordering eight countries. Everything here is vast. From the Taklamakan Desert, the largest in China, to the Bayanbulak grasslands that seem to roll on forever. The climate in the Bayanbulak is almost as dry as the neighboring desert. But the grassland is fed by countless streams and rivers falling from the surrounding mountains. For a long time, this has been a home of Xinjiang's Mongol population, providing ample pasture for their livestock and the wide open spaces that underpin their nomadic lifestyle. Horses are central to Mongol culture and are treated with great affection and respect. In fact, it's been said a Mongol without a horse is only half a man. For young Naingtai, riding a horse is as natural as walking. And even at his tender age, he's a champion in the saddle. Ente to city dwellers, camping out in a remote valley for months at a time may seem a harsh and difficult lifestyle, but the Mongols take it in their stride. Sandal in 
Sustlum birkaç Sen lütfen ki gat, şart olsun avat. The rhythm of this life is slow and steady, and centered around family, horses, and livestock in that order. To the Mongol, the horse is more than an animal. They're constant companions, symbols of freedom and well-being, essential for work and play. Horse racing is a favorite sport, and Nayingtai is about to test his skills at the annual celebration of Mongol culture. It's festival time on the Bayung Bulak. The big annual event on the Bayan Bulak grassland is the Nadam Festival, a four-day celebration of Mongolian culture and sport that starts with great pomp and ceremony. Historically, the Nadam focuses on the so-called three manly skills. Horse racing, wrestling, and archery. Embracing skills that Mongolians have honed in battle over the centuries. These days, women can compete in archery and horse racing, but the wrestling remains men only. Mongolian wrestling dates back as early as the 13th century, when Genghis Khan ruled the steppes. A military sport for improving the strength and stamina of his troops. Today, it's the most popular sport for Mongolians. The rules are simple. Last man standing wins. Three Before the horse racing properly gets underway, other events demand great riding skills too. Oh. 
Nying Tai warms up for his races by competing on the obstacle course, where riders try to get round all the strategically placed drums in the quickest time possible. Nying Tai isn't placed in this competition and decides to sit the next one out. It's the crowd favorite. Contestants gallop towards scarves on the ground, bending down to try to pick them up. Some riders make it look ridiculously easy. Others, not so much. Perhaps it's just as well Nying Tai gave it a miss. Horse racing at the Nadam involves several races over various distances. All a vigorous test of speed and endurance for horse and jockey. Even though Nying Tai has won several Nadam titles over the years, he's been training hard for his specialist event, a breakneck five kilometers. When he's racing, Nying Tai is only concerned with the very basics. Steering his horse around the course and hanging on for dear life. Nying Tai is a rider of great skill and determination. As the race goes on, he opens up a big lead on the rest of the field. The result is never in doubt. Nying Tai adds another Nadam title to his impressive collection. And finally, gets to enjoy the festivities as a spectator. Desert dominates one quarter of Xinjiang, like the Taklamakan which literally translates to, you can get into, but will never get out. And yet, for over one and a half thousand years, this was one of the main highways of the fabled Silk Road, the ancient network of trading routes between the East and the West. But it wasn't just silk that passed along these routes. Almost any commodity thinkable began moving across Eurasia. By braving the wilds of Xinjiang, traders made their fortunes or died trying. In the east, the Silk Road started in Xi'an, the ancient capital of China, and went west over land through the heart of Asia onto Europe and ending in Venice and Genoa. In Xinjiang, the main northern route of the Silk Road wove in between so-called oasis towns like Hami and Turpan, and one of the most famous of all, Zhaohe. Zhaohe was built on an island where two rivers met, walled by steep 30-meter cliffs. It was a natural fortress and home to a thriving city. And thanks to the arid desert climate, the earthen ruins are still remarkably well preserved. Mm -hmm. 
Xu Dongliang is an expert on ancient relics who knows Zhao He well. He's a master of restoring ancient silk artifacts recovered from ruined cities like this. The最早的居民是大概距今两千五百多年以前，人们为了躲避那个野兽的袭击之后，人们就在这个台地上来生活，因为它四周全是河谷，是三平均三十米高的悬崖峭壁，这样的话它在上面生活比较安全。交河古城
，固定之后拉一根长线过来，把收针的地方也做一个固定，每隔三毫米到两毫米，把它钉一下，这样的话它那个口子就不会再开。最重要的就是把失传的东西给它衔接起来，再把它继续传播下去，它就构成了整个这个文明的一个传承的一个链条，是这个链条一环扣一环，不要断裂。生命是通过文物来延续下去的。In contrast to the ruins of Zhao He, another northern city has undergone spectacular growth, especially in recent years. Urumqi is the capital of Xinjiang, and also has the distinction of being the furthest city from the sea in the world, about 2,400 kilometers from the nearest ocean. Despite that, it's officially designated a port, which allows it to offer lower tax rates to help attract business and investment. But there's a much bigger picture. Urumqi's dramatic development is largely driven by the Belt and Road Initiative. Launched in 2013, this is China's visionary plan to create a new Silk Road transforming the old overland and maritime trade routes through massive investment in infrastructure. Under Belt and Road, Urumqi is fast becoming one of China's most important transport hubs. Handling Chinese exports on the new and improved rail networks to Central Asia and Europe. Now,在所在的就是乌鲁木齐站。在从国际的沟通上来说，乌鲁木齐可以说是我国“一带一路”最为重要的一个桥头堡，连接着西方和东方，包括我们经济文化交流的一个枢节点。物资运输这块来说，
like so many other things, arrived from the west down the Silk Road. Uyghurs have a rich culture, including a distinctive musical genre known as Mu Khan, which translated means melody. In a village near the northern city of Turpan, this small school band is tuning up for a day's study. And there's a lot to learn. Mu Khan combines poetry, dance, classical music, and folk songs largely played on traditional instruments. These children are studying Mukam during their normal school holidays. Attendance is voluntary and tuition is free. The headmaster says it's the responsibility of the older generations to keep the Mukam heritage alive. <laughs> The headmaster's grandson, an accomplished Mukha musician himself, is home on holiday from university in Beijing to also teach at the school. This style of mukam has 12 separate pieces, all with different rhythms, melodies, and tempos. Playing just one piece can take two hours. Playing all 12 would literally take all day. It's a lifetime's work to master the mukam. That's why starting early is so important. It's a lot of work for these youngsters, especially when they could be enjoying a break from normal school. But there's clearly something in this ancient musical form that strikes a chord in their young hearts.
تزرش هر خل مشو مقام چالدگان موسیقی لان یوتش شما ازم کزکدگان بغلگم چین It's said that the music and dance of Mukam are essential to the Uyghur as eating and drinking. Certainly these talented youngsters have built up quite an appetite and a celebration meal is well deserved. <laughs> ام با نقش موسیقی هم مکان دیگر میس آدم نه تا چهار سال وقت لاده برای پرده برای نقشون یه پسچ باش که چهار چهارش لاده همیشه کتر کترلی کتی دو آرک آدم نه ما اون دن کپوب ساکی کتی دو بو چون روی آرزوک با روی دوره دیم از بنا میاد. من مشتاق تا اتمش بیش از کردم من مشو سهنی چیستم یا یکیم بیش یا 36 تا ماین هالش کلم همینه کاغذ لاما منگوشش ازون عمر کرد ازور نب بزنی که جمعیت مس مشو مقام میراس آدم از دام بالا The city of Turpan and the surrounding area has the distinction of being one of the hottest places on earth. In fact, it's known as China's Fireland. In the long, arid summer, temperatures regularly hit well over 40 degrees Celsius. And the searing surface of the sand can be twice as hot. just perfect for the ancient Uyghur medical practice of sand therapy. Something people from all over China visit to experience. Akbar has been coming here every year for the last 12 years. He normally stays 10 days at a time and credits the sand therapy for easing pains in his back, arms and knees. Even though Akbar is a sand therapy veteran, he's checked every day to make sure he's not overdoing it. Too much puts him at risk of dehydration and heat stroke. And people with high blood pressure, heart disease and diabetes have to get medical clearance to take the treatment. Uyghur medicine has a long history in Xinjiang. Uyghur tibabetchiligi, Jungo, Vatan tibabetchiligi, Davala Surlanon, Persipolop, Bogumla Rap, Pla, Kum, 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 Sharklak, Kisal Davala Iran, Davala, Uyghur tibabetchiligi, Davala Surlanon, Persip, and the Bokal Davala Rematism Lak, Bogum Yalore. <laughs> 
Akbar is quite at home in the burning sand. Incredibly, he barely raises a sweat. Shimia but Turpan is not all scorching desert. In fact, large parts have been transformed into lush and bountiful farmland, producing a wide range of top quality fruit in the long, hot, bone dry summers. And the undoubted star is the humble grape, grown here for over 2,000 years. Here in Grape Valley, nearly 100 different varieties are cultivated, and the region's raisins are eaten all over the world. That Grape Valley exists at all is thanks to an ancient irrigation system known as Cares. An engineering wonder consisting of hundreds of wells connected to more than 5,000 kilometers of underground channels. Using the natural fall of the land, the water reaches the crops where it's needed. Much of Grape Valley is still made up of small family holdings. Young families like Ardil and Jamila Imin and their children, 10-year-old Sophia and Muhammad, who's seven. <laughs> Zum <gülüyor> Hmm. <gülüyor> 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 These huge bunches are the region's famous variety, the Manaitse. Even though they're highly sought after fresh as table grapes, it's when they're dried using traditional turpan methods that they're taken to another level. These mud brick buildings, known as chuncha, are built on exposed ridges and are full of holes so the drying desert winds can blow straight through. <laughs> Grapes are surely one of the treasures of Turpan, but not only for the produce itself. Grape Valley is becoming a favorite tourist destination. The combination of high quality fruit, the romance of vines cascading over trellis, and the old world charm of the local people combined to make a heady brew.
Grapes are not the only crop to be successfully grown here. 520,000 hectares of cotton stretch over the horizon. This is where over 80% of China's cotton is grown. The industry dominates the economy of several parts of Xinjiang, notably the capital Urumqi and the nearby city of Shihurtza. Mrs. Yang has been working in the cotton industry for 30 years. This is one of her own cotton fields and the harvest is well underway, dawn till dusk. Although her fields are now harvested by machine, some plants around the edges are missed and need to be hand-picked. One of the main changes is the move away from watering the cotton plants by hand, a time-consuming and wasteful practice with so much precious water lost through evaporation. The modern solution is to bury tubing to deliver the water down at the roots, drip by drip. The other big change has been the shift to mechanical harvesting. It said one machine can do the work of 2,000 workers each day. And it certainly made Mrs. Young's life much easier. Although Mrs. Young now saves the effort, money and time by using mechanical harvesters, her income is still dependent on how much cotton she can produce. It all comes down to the next few days and she's feeling the pressure. Mr. Xu is very much in demand at harvest time. He owns and operates five harvesting machines, and right now, they're working night and day. Woodside 这个农民他就这个意识非常强烈，就盼望我们赶紧就把棉花就收回去。Although mechanical harvesting means no more work for seasonal cotton pickers, thousands of new jobs have been created at processing plants and textile factories set up locally to cash in on the cotton-producing boom. And with the Belt and Road Initiative providing new high-speed rail links, these industries are in a great place to benefit from expanding trade.
even though some parts of Xinjiang are intensely cultivated, vast areas are wide open. Frontier land. China's very own Wild West. And, appropriately enough, there's even a wild horse here. Not a domestic horse that escaped and went feral, but a truly wild horse. The only species in the world. This is Shabalsky's horse, named after a Russian explorer who discovered it on his travels in 1878. Nomadic people of Xinjiang and Mongolia had hunted the horse for centuries for its meat and skin. But in the 20th century, overhunting, loss of habitat, and a series of very severe winters saw Shavalsky's horse declared extinct in the wild. The only surviving members of the species were in European zoos. And by the end of the 1950s, there were just 12 left. And only nine capable of breeding. An international effort was launched to save the horse, with captive breeding programs in several zoos worldwide. And here in Xinjiang. This工作已经十七年、十八年了 the vet and his students have to make sure any injuries or diseases are treated fast and effectively. In such a vulnerable population, any fatality is a massive blow. Be None of Shivalsky's horses bred here have been returned fully to the wild. The closest is a herd moved to a wildlife reserve. Even there, they are closely monitored and given extra feed over the long winter. If the weather is too severe, they're rounded up and returned to the center. It's hoped that one day, the wild horse will once again run completely free. The survival of Shabalsky's horse is hailed as one of the great comebacks in conservation history. It was truly an international effort, and there are now an estimated 2,000 horses worldwide, and 438 here in one of their original homes. <laughs> Shabalsky's horse 
，这个上面以后这些他们也对这个野马子做一些贡献。如果我们这个愿望是那么奔跑那种一群一群的野马，能看到就行，我很高兴。The people of Xinjiang may come from different ethnic groups and cultures. They may have different beliefs and interests. But they also have a lot in common. To survive and make a life here, in such an extreme environment, they have to be determined and resilient. With a physical and mental toughness, that sets them apart. Their attitudes reflect the landscape, dynamic and strong, big and bold. Xinjiang is a place where the past is respected and the future is embraced. Where the Silk Road, the world's greatest trading route, is being revived in spectacular fashion. This frontier land, so long remote, is fast becoming, once again, a region of influence and opportunity. <laughs>